So those who may well think that their jobs uh, could be jeopardized, they will, we will continue to support them through the other initiatives that are underway. But thank you very much for also bringing that to our attention. Thank you, House Chair. Thank you, Honorable President. Honorable Members, question number two has been asked by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. The Honorable President. Honorable House Chair, after several delays, the issue of lifestyle audits of members of the executives is underway firmly. This process is being led by the Director General, and one of the reasons why we have directed that it should be led by the Director General, it is because even members' interests, interests of executive members, are managed by the Director General in her office. And we wanted this process to reside there and to be properly administered. And it is in that regard that these audits are now continuing. As I indicated, the aim of lifestyle audit is to collect as much information, some of which already resides in her office as she is the repository of the information of all of us in the executive. And this had initially been outsourced, and in the end we found that the coverage of precisely what we sought was not as effective as we wanted it to be. It is now in the right place, under the right management, and the process continues. And this does so even, even as we continue now, and that office has now sourced competent, skilled personnel with experience in conducting lifestyle audits, and the capacity building exercise took longer than anticipated, but it is firmly underway. And this is the first time that national government is conducting lifestyle audits on its members, and it requires new systems, systems that have now been set in place. It requires processes and methodologies that should be deployed or employed so that it is able to get, bring to bear rather, all the information that is required. The DG will decide on the most appropriate way to communicate the outcomes of the audit once completed. Thank you, House Chair. Thank you, Honorable President. The first supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Leader of the Opposition. Thank you. Mr. President, it was in your 2018 SONA that you first promised lifestyle audits on your cabinet ministers, but this has been another broken promise. If you'd kept your promise, Mr. President, perhaps many of the allegations of egregious corruption against your Deputy President, Mr. Mashatile, would have come to light, and the requisite action could have then been taken. And you can't say it can't be done because the DA showed you it could be done. Alan Windy implemented in the first six months of his term lifestyle audits on its members. And now you again announce lifestyle audits 71 days before the end of the parliamentary term. How is anyone supposed to take you seriously on your commitment to lifestyle audits? Mr. President, we've also just learned to the last hour that the Speaker's house was raided by the Hawks over corruption allegations dating back to a time when she was appointed as your Defence Minister by you. Order, Honourable Members. Your failure to implement lifestyle audits is what has facilitated this alleged corruption by the Speaker. Mr President, since you are the reason that lifestyle audits were not done, you are the reason we're sitting with an allegedly corrupt Deputy President, a Speaker whose house is being raided, and a Cabinet that reads like Zondo's most wanted list. Given that you... Order, Honourable Members. Order. Are you going to take responsibility and accept, Mr President, that in this matter, you are accused number one? Thank you. The, hon 
Order, honorable members. Order, the honorable president. I have explained that, yes, this matter has taken an inordinately long time. However, it is a matter that is being addressed and reaching finality. And indeed, it's a very serious matter that requires the serious attention that we are bringing to bear on it. I'm quite satisfied that the process that we have now embarked upon, a process that is going to streamline precisely how this is done, a process which will also be a very good precedent to the next following administrations of uh, this country uh, will be such that we have a good system, a good process that is going to address the issue of lifestyle audits. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Thank you, Honorable President. The second supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Ms. Tim Gweba. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable President, with the detailed response. Uh, Honorable House Chair, the DA stance on lifestyle audits is not based on the principle of, of morality, but about grandstanding, so that we don't focus on their, recent, on, on their racist conduct on the city of Cape Town and on the Israel genocide against Palestinians. The DA, the DA is inherently racist, immoral, and hypocritical. Honorable President, provinces as order, honorable members, lifestyle order. Audits. The honorable president must hear the question. Honorable President, provinces has also undertaken lifestyle audits and experienced similar challenges, as you have said. For example, they faced capacity challenges to the extent that the Northern Cape Office of the, Pre of the Premier have developed a service level agreement with the Special Investigation Unit as a law enforcement agencies within the necessary investigative capabilities. This is also because several What is the question, Honorable Member? Information. Therefore, Honorable President, what measures can enhance the, leg the, the, the lifestyle audit system and the East Legislative Authority to access various data points and enhance its rigor and impact? Thank you, President. The Honorable President. Thank you. Yes, there have been a number of approaches that have been utilized. A number of uh, entities in our government, both national and provincial, have utilized a variety of methods. And some of those have been outsourcing, for instance, to audit firms, and some have been to the SIU, and some have been to other entities. And uh, they have found that some methods or processes are more effective, and uh, we do hope that they are able to come out with the type of information that will enable us to address the issue or the question of corruption itself and bring to bear sufficient information as to be able to, ena to enable us to take actions on. At the national level, we looked at a number of processes and uh, we've now resolved that the process that we have embarked upon has more efficacy and will be able to yield the results that we desire. And it is this process and system that is now underway the, through the Director General, whom we have, office rather, who, which we have trusted to manage information uh, and declarations of the executive. We do believe that it is well capacitated and now with the additional personnel that we brought in, it is well capacitated to deal more effectively with the lifestyle audit system. And as I said, this is the first time at national level that we have embarked on uh, lifestyle audits and we are perfecting, we are going to perfect this system as we move on. And let me be clear 
that this is not even an attempt to dodge, to move away from this whole process. It is to handle it as effectively as possible without leaving any gaps or any holes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable President. The third supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Singh. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Chairperson. Honorable President, as you quite rightly say, lifestyle audits has been a long time coming, 30 years. But anyway, they say better late than never. What I'd like to know, Honorable President, with 70 days to go in office as president of the country, if it is found, and I'm not talking about the future, I'm not a Sangom, uh, or, or a prophet, Honorable President, not a prophet. If it is found that some members of the executive, in this current executive, are, are, are found to have uh, financially mismanaged uh, uh, the monies in the fiscus or done anything untoward, what kind of steps are you envisaging as consequent management for those recalcitrant members of the executive? Thank you. The Honorable President. Any member of the executive who will be found to have mismanaged the funding, the funds of the state, of the people, must face the consequences of the law. That has to be the case. And uh, the law enforcement agencies will be furnished with whatever information that ferrets out misdeeds like that, and there will be consequences. Those who participate in activities that go against the ethics that are required must face the consequences. And that is something that we have, I'm very clear on. So that will be the case. So thank you very much. As you say, better late than never. And this is precisely that we are doing. Thank you, Honorable President. The last supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Sheikh Imam. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chairperson. Mr. President, <clears throat> allow me to welcome your intervention in ensuring there are lifestyle audits. But as you know, if you've just heard recently, the serious allegations of the so-called audit machine in the country, that is the DA, on John Stiernason, Honorable John Stiernason, allegations of corruption from party funding. Now, what additional measures would you put in place to ensure that family members, associates, and friends are also audited in some way or other to ensure that, of course, we have a process that is, of course, uh, clean and that we will have the, uh, the re re required uh, results? Thank you. Thank you. The Honorable President. The declarations that are made to the Office of the Director General do touch on issues such as interests by relatives and all that. But the lifestyle audits that are now underway are going to go into greater depth and be able to identify uh, linkages such as those. So to give you a very plain answer on that, there will be that process of linking the dots and seeing whether they do finally link to any persons who may be involved in malfeasance and in any form of corruption involving state money. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable President. Honorable Members, question number three has been asked by the Honorable M. Noncele to the Honorable President. The Honorable President. Honorable House Chair and Honorable Members, between 2020 and 2023, the Presidential Employment Stimulus, PSC it is popularly known, has created work and livelihoods for over 1.7 million people. Of the participants in the various programs, 65% have been women, 85% young people. The Presidential Employment Stimulus has built an institutional architecture that is able to scale rapidly should the opportunity do so arise. Right now, fiscal constraints mean that 
While the program has been extended to March 2025, it is not currently able to expand beyond the numbers that we had wanted it to expand. The focus in the coming year is therefore on taking the quality of outcomes to the next level, focusing on enhancing the work experience for participants, as well as the quality of the social value they create for communities. This includes skills development, both soft skills derived from work experience, as well as more formal skills development. Different programs are able to achieve this to different extents, depending on the budgets made available. For example, in the Social Employment Fund, the skills development offered is a key criterion in the selection of implementing partners. Programs such as the Basic Education Employment Initiative have also augmented what they can offer by building partnerships with a number of CETAs and Tivet colleges as well. This initiative's approach to skills development focuses on demand-led skilling, which is about increasing the relevance and the delivery of interventions to address a particular area of need in various sectors of our economy, particularly where the public sector is the main actor. To take forward this work, the Department of Higher Education and Training, with the support of the Presidency, has established demand-led skilling work streams in priority growth areas. This initiative, in partnership with the National Skills Fund, has also launched Jobs Boost, as it's called, a 300 million outcomes fund that will fund implementing organizations to skill quite a number of young people who are marginalized, some 4,500. The initiative itself has made a real difference in the lives of millions of young people in our country. As you go through the length and the breadth of the country, you find that it is an initiative that has indeed touched the lives of many. Through the work already done, we have established a firm foundation of those initiatives to make an even greater contribution to addressing poverty, unemployment, and inequality. And one of the reasons why we initiated this whole intervention was during COVID, when jobs were being lost left, right, and center, and when the private sector was also not really active in creation in creating jobs we found this to fill the gap to be an intervention that fills the gap but it has also continued to play a more important role with regard to skilling young people and in some cases getting them job ready and making them enable with confidence to be able to look for jobs and this program has been most effective and many people have found it to be so. Thank you, House Chair. Thank you, Honorable President. The first supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Nonsele. Thank you, House Chair. Thanks, Honorable President, for your incisive explanations and responses. It goes a long way to clarify the interventions that you have made, particularly during the period of COVID. Uh, now we have seen jobs being, in fact, increased far greater than the period before COVID time. Honorable President, given that the issue of unemployment remains one of the main challenges that the country is facing, is there another way to encourage all relevant stakeholders, including social partners, to participate in an even more massive employment creation? Thank you, President. The Honorable President. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Yes, there are a number of ways in which we can bring in a number of partners and social partners, stakeholders, to play a role in the whole task of 
addressing unemployment. I recently held a meeting with business and government, and out of that meeting came a number of interesting proposals from the private sector about how they can cooperate with government. And they also included setting up a small medium enterprise fund of great scale to fund small and medium enterprises to enable them to be able to run their businesses in a way where they can create jobs. And there are quite a number of other initiatives which they have come up with that will uh, enable us to train young people to get them even more better prepared for the world of work. And yes, the main one is to create an environment, continue with our reforms, to create environments that will enable business to create jobs, and also to embark on various initiatives that will, or incentives rather, that will crowd in business and entice them to create jobs. And these are initiatives that are important uh, to be able to bring more and more people into employment. So initiatives are being embarked upon and creativity is the order of the day. And we've just come out of this morning of the infrastructure symposium where through infrastructure, we're finding that there's a great deal of interest from the private sector to work with government through various funding initiatives to support the creation of jobs. So we are going to continue doing precisely that because our aim is to create more and more jobs so that more and more of our people can get out of poverty. Thank you very much, House Chair. Thank you, Honorable President. The second supplementary question will be asked by the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Uh, according to Stats SA's recent quarterly Labour Force survey, two and a half million young people under 25 cannot find work. There's no getting around the truth. You and the ANC have failed the young people of South Africa. Now, your government's only solution is to create two-month job opportunities for people, and then they're back in the unemployment queue, which is now 12 million people long, thanks to your government, yourself, and your policy. The only place where real sustainable jobs are being created, Mr. President, is in the DA-run Western Cape, where 368,000 new real jobs were created in a single year, thanks to good, clean, accountable government that creates an enabling environment for jobs to flourish. Unlike the ANC manifesto, which promises only temporary, temporary low-paid government jobs, our pledge is to create two million real jobs. Mr. President, in your last sonar, before you were forced to walk it back by Minister Manitaka, What is the question, Manitaka, Honourable Member? Do you still believe that it's the private sector that creates jobs, and your job is to create the enabling environment for those real jobs to flourish? The Honourable President. Honourable uh, House Chair, if the Honourable Leader of the Opposition had listened very carefully to my previous answer, he would, he would have heard me say that all stakeholders have an important role in the process of creating jobs. And so all of us, and I have that responsibility, and I'm rather glad that all various stakeholders, unions, the private sector, community-based organizations, and indeed, you know, even financial institutions do agree that we all need to work together to create the jobs that are necessary to bring down the level of unemployment. Thank you very much, House Chair. Thank you, Honorable President. The Third supplementary question will be asked by the Honourable Ms. Denner. Thank you, House Chair. Honourable President, um, we've heard you say that there will be, uh, you said, uh, initiatives are being embarked upon and there will be cooperation between government and the private sector, etc. 
to create jobs. And we all know that, yes, there have been 1.2 million jobs created by the Presidential Employment Stimulus Program, which is a wonderful th thing, but it's short-term jobs. And we, ne we need more permanent jobs to ensure that our people can look after themselves and their families. So what I would like to know, Honourable President, is would your government consider and, and just to take a step back, we know that this program is ending at the end of March 2025, which is quite a pity. But would your government consider relaxing restrictive labour legislation to also enable the private sector to create jobs? Because the private sector is the largest job creator in the country. Thank you, sir. The Honourable President. Labour legislation continues to be under discussions with our various partners. And that in itself is aimed at making sure that, yes, we consolidate and protect the rights that workers have and also go to the extent of protecting them against things like injuries at work, uh, calamities and death at work. They also go to an extent of saying, how can we work together to increase more employment. So it's a combination of all those approaches that we have brought to bear in having discussions with uh, labor and business uh, in the various discussions that we are having. The program itself, is, as it has been with, for instance, the social relief of disaster, has been rolled on from year to year, meaning that we are looking at a way in which we can properly consolidate an initiatives like that and institutionalize it. And those discussions are underway. This program has been found to be most effective indeed. We started off with the YES program, Youth Employment Service, where we invited the private sector to bring in young people into employment for training. And in no time as it unfolded, even the private sector entities that had brought them in just for the initial training found that many of them were so good that they kept them. So employment then increased. And with this program, which you've spoken about as well, the President Employment Stimulus, we opened it up and it has ended up impacting on 1.7 million people, 85% of them being young people. What we have found is that it is so effective that we're now looking at ways in which there can be permanence to it. As opposed, for instance, to your EPWP, which offered many of our people more shorter-term job opportunities, this one offers them slightly more long-term, a year or so. That has enabled them to gain skills. That has enabled them to be job-prepared. A number of them have now migrated not too many, but a number of them have migrated out of the program to find jobs in other sectors. And it makes young people job ready. It gives them the confidence and it gives them the ability to get into jobs and be productive and be really good contributing workers. So I tend to look at the more positive side the positive side is that, in a way, this is building a model. We're building a model that can be institutionalized for the future, but that can also lead to more permanence in terms of getting people who participate in it to be employed for a much longer period. So it is all good, and your question also addresses a very important area which we are approaching in a very positive way rather than negatively and saying, what is it that we can do to enhance the situation of working people 
in our country. We've got 16.7 million of them. And we're also looking at how can we increase the numbers. And if legislation needs to be tweaked here and there to even increase the numbers more, that's precisely what all the partners need to be looking at and touching on. I'm sorry I went on a bit too long, but for me, this is a very important issue, as I'm sure it is important to you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Honorable President. The last supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Singh. Thank you, Chair. Mr. President, I'm really earning my keep today uh, because I'm supposed to be Honorable uh, Hendricks. But it also reminds me, um, uh, Mr. President, that you stood on this platform telling us that the Commission for Remuneration will finalize their work in January. We are still sitting here as members of this House not knowing what our packages are going to be. So I hope as an aside you'll look into that matter. But on the question of unemployment, yes, Mr. President, the YES program is certainly having a positive impact on, on young people. Would it not be possible for this, you said you want to accelerate the program. What we find is that there needs to be discussion with tertiary institutions and business, as you said, to match the required skills in the marketplace and government. Because you find that students go to tertiary institutions sometimes and just study something that's not appropriate for the market. And the other arena, Honorable President, is the question of vocational education. Not everybody needs to have a degree, a BA or undergraduate. What about the plumbers and everybody else? who earn electricians, who earn a lot more money than us because they've got this vocational ability. What can be done in that regard? Thank you. The Honorable President. Thank you. Our focus now, as we extend support for educating young people, is to ensure that they are getting skills, that is their education is more geared towards the vocational side of things rather than just pure academics. Even as we look at NESFAS, the NESFAS funding and NESFAS Minister of Higher Education will tell you that we're now going way beyond 1.2 million in terms of uh, applications and we're going to be funding almost a million or so young people. We're now tending to get young people more and more to get into not so much your universities. Of course, young people, many of them want to go to universities, but we are tilting more towards saying colleges, TVET colleges, where they can go and learn real skills, vocational skills, and also showcasing that it's good to be a plumber, it's good to be a boiler maker, good to be a fitter and a turner, and to have all those wonderful skills that are useful in industry. We also engage in the private sector to help us, particularly at the college level, to craft the curriculums that are going to bring about the skills that are needed in industry. And a number of companies have taken to adopting, if you like, adopting or cooperating with our colleges and are getting involved. And some of them are even deploying lecturers so that we can sharpen the wits and the skills of our young people. So the direction and the movement is towards more vocational skills and making young people become more and more aware that that is where their employability lies, because it's pretty pointless to go and earn a degree and find that that degree does not equip you to be employable. And we are finding that many of the young people who are getting real employment are those who have skills that are required by industry, who are able to contribute in a more practical way. And we're moving more and more in that direction. So thank you very much for raising the question. Thank you, Honorable President. Honorable Members, we'll proceed to the next question, which is question number four. That has been asked by the Honorable Shlabisa to the Honorable President. The Honorable President. Honorable Chair, House Chair, 
this government has acted decisively and with purpose to respond to the findings of the recommendations of State Capture Commission. I addressed Parliament soon after uh, the report came out and covered quite extensively the response that this government uh, is going to have. And on October 2022 is the time when I submitted my intentions with regards to the implementation and recommendations thereof. Amongst other things, the State Capture Commission made 200 recommendations with respect to criminal investigation and possible prosecution of individuals, entities as in companies, and named groups of people. These recommendations were directed by the Commission to law enforcement agencies. The Commission also made recommendations with respect to further investigation of and possible action by the relevant bodies against individuals and entities for disciplinary offenses, tax offenses, delinquency of directors, and other activities. The Presidency provided each of the bodies to which such recommendations were directed with copies of each part of the report as they were received by the Commission so that they may act on recommendations in line with their respective mandates. As has been reported on several occasions to this Parliament and to the public more broadly, these recommendations are currently receiving attention from a number of law enforcement agencies and other bodies. Therefore, as regards the recommendations with respect to criminal investigation and possible prosecution and other actions against individuals, the President has fully acted upon the recommendations of the Commission. As I indicated in a written reply to this House on my birthday, on the 17th of November in 2022, any actions that I take with respect to members of the Executive about whom the Commission made findings will be informed by the outcomes of the processes that are undertaken by relevant entities that have the responsibility, the capacity to do their work. The extensive actions that this administration has taken on the recommendations of the State Capture Commission, including the introduction of draft legislation, changes that are currently before this House, have been detailed in several public reports. The most recent comprehensive report was published in November of 2023, and there is a, there is a searchable online database that enables members of the public and indeed members of parliament to track progress because we have dutifully put that online. And if we are able to follow what we are doing online, we'll be able to see what progress is being made. Now, there is the continuous fable that goes around that we are doing nothing about the recommendation of the State Capture Commission. That is a lie, because a lot of work is being done. And I took the trouble, soon after that report was tabled, to come to this body to outline precisely what the government's response is, and to identify all those 200 recommendations and to detail precisely what various agencies themselves have to do. And as I've said, we will take action when those agencies that have the capacity, that have the capability to do the work they should do, have come forward. And some of them have investigative capacity, some of them have prosecutorial capacities, 
That is what is going to guide me and should guide us all. Legislative pieces have been put here, and when you go through that online um, database, you'll find that we're tracking everything that the Zondo Commission has recommended. So I want to repeat, it is not true that nothing is being done about the recommendations of the Zondo Commission. Thank you, Honorable President. The first supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Shlabisa. Thank you very much, Honorable President, for the response to the question. I must say the response sounds very nice, Honorable President. Thank you. The only... <laughs> The only problem, the, the, the only problem, Honorable President, is that no matter how nice the response is, but what people see is different from the response. Now, the question, Honorable President, I will, I'm going to ask, I presume the question will get a similar response that we have given. It will add, it will add confidence to the public because what we saw in the action taken against the deputy minister is what the public is expecting in relation to the state capture report. My question therefore is, can we expect anything before the end of this term being an action taken out of the state capture report? Thank you. The Honorable President. Mr. Singh, your neighbor, and the member of your party said he's not a Sangoma. <laughs> and we may have taken that very lightly, but you, I hope you are not suggesting that I should be a Sangoma. But where there is, where there would be, and where there is any form of evidence that would speak to the issues that I was addressing, yes, action will be taken. Because we have to take action based on facts, on real information. And without that, we would just be speculating. And I would urge that all of us not that we should be scientific, that what all of us should be endowed with some ability to be able to sift chaff from facts and say where there are facts, action needs to be taken. And in answer to your question, if there is that evidence and those facts, yes, action will be taken. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable President. The second supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Dlakude. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, President, for your comprehensive response to this question. We have noted that significant um, progress has been made to bring those responsible for state capture to justice. Implicated individuals and, bus and businesses are under investigation and stolen funds are being recovered progressively. Could you please provide more information, Honorable President, on how these recovered funds have helped to enhance growth and also to boost investor confidence. I thank you. The Honorable President. Thank you, Honorable uh, Lakude. A great deal of follow through has been happening uh, following the State Capture Commission recommendations and findings. And you're touching on a very important aspect which we don't often give pay attention to, for instance, the recovery of monies
that were stolen have run into billions. I mean, real billions. The follow-up or follow-through from a tax point of view has also been taking place and billions have been paid in taxes for those who were either dodging payment of taxes or concealing whatever. And where contracts, contracts that were not supposed to have been entered into have been can, uh, cancelled. And I can count that it amounted to something like 86 billion rand at some stage, which is a substantial amount of money. So on that silent part of monies that are being recovered, uh, taxes that are now being paid, contracts that are being cancelled, asset forfeiture has also been part of this whole process where well over 64 billion rand worth of assets have been forfeited to the state. So all these things speak to what is being done. And this is not a fable. And it's possible that maybe we don't communicate enough and we don't beam this out sufficiently because this is what, yes, the people of South Africa ought to know. The commission cost us well over a billion rand, but the recoveries have been way above what we paid in getting the commission underway. And there are still going to be more recoveries. There are still going to be more arrests. There are investigations that are underway. Our prosecutorial or criminal justice agencies are busy as we speak with a number of those cases. And of course, as South Africans, we want to see everything happening now. And we want to see big names now. We want to see all those things happening now. And the findings of the commission were just two years ago. And these things in the government system do take time, but they are happening. Monies are being recovered, taxes are being paid. So there is progress, and all I would say is that yes, we should open our eyes and open our ears and we will see more. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable President. The third supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Swart. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Honorable President, the ACDP appreciates that progress is being made. Um, having served on the ESCOM inquiry here in Parliament, we also saw how MPs came together to get to the bottom of state capture and corruption. And then Sorry, the I, I didn't hear that. I mean... No, I said we appreciated the progress that has been made and that many of us served on the ESCOM inquiry that preceded the Zondo Commission. However, we fully appreciate that it's an avalanche of cases, an avalanche of cases. My apologies, Honorable Swart. Will you just switch off the microphone of that member? Please proceed, Honorable Member. We also appreciate, Honorable President, that it's an avalanche of cases, and these are very complex forensic cases requiring a lot of funding. Given that, I'm sure you would agree, Honorable President, that additional funding should be given to the law enforcement agencies, and it is a concern when we see budget cuts, and possibly that the funds in the Criminal Assets Recovery Account, the CORA account, can go towards these law enforcement agencies that can collect billions of rands and can leverage a, an extra 500 million and they can collect 10 billion rand so that we can recover those ill-gotten gains. Thank you, President. Honorable President. Thank you very much, uh, Honorable Swart. Yes, indeed, you're absolutely right. We need to resource those agencies, uh, criminal justice agencies even more uh, because when they do their work, they do it thoroughly, and they therefore need to be capacitated, including SARS. When we have capacitated SARS, we have found that they are able to collect more and more taxes on behalf of the nation. So you are right, and whatever uh, budget rationalization we have to go through, needs to keep that into account, that if nothing else, we need to give them more and more funding. 
and I've actually seen it with the police over years, and uh, Honorable Grunewald, who keeps a close eye on this, what we have tended to do is to sort of shortchange the police and the defense budget over a number of years, 11 years and more. And it is now that we are increasing the numbers of police by 30,000 over the past three years that we are going to start seeing gains Although they still need to be well-trained, they still need to be well-skilled, but we are going to see a complete reversal of the downward slide that we were on. And similarly with defense, but more importantly, in the areas that you are talking about, that those criminal investigation agencies need to be given more firepower. The caravans, yes, are also being deployed for some of those purposes but we need to be deploying more and more of uh, the fiscal uh, firepower to those agencies so that they are able to do their work. But once again, thank you very much for that suggestion as well. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable President. The last supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Kwankwa. Thank you ever so much, House Chair. Uh, President, President, speaking at uh, a group of international investors in, uh, at the Financial Times Africa Summit in London in 2019, you put the official, est rather the estimate of the amount of money that the country has lost to state capture to about 500 billion rands, if you remember correctly. You said, in fact, it's more than that. But now when you consider that the, the asset forfeiture unit has been granted freeze orders of about 14 billion rands for state capture related activities and about 8.6 billion rands in corrupt proceeds has been returned to the state and no senior figure or political figure has been arrested while we know many of them were involved in state capture. Would you confidently say that you have been able to disentangle government from a comprehensive web of state capture related entanglements, given what I've just said? Thank you. Honorable President. One of the things that we've been able to do in the current administration is to enable those agencies to act independently, to act according to their mandate and the ethos that is set out in our constitution. And making them or empowering them, I would say, with those underpinnings, if one can call it that, has enabled them to do their work more effectively without any fear, favor, or prejudice. And when we see our state uh, uh, agencies acting, we should know that they do so independently, having done thorough investigations, having done thorough work. And I've tended to say that they need to be given that leeway completely so that they do their work without any political interference and they should be able to make the decisions and the choices, however difficult they may be. And in this regard, I expect them to continue doing their investigations, and I've even said so publicly to them, do your work. All we have to do is to create that environment, that political environment that will enable them to do their work. So in the end, as they do their work, I am sure that they will come to deal with whatever case, small, medium, or large, important, high-flying, or whatever, they will be able to do so. And when they do so, we should allow them the space and the ability to do the work that they should. Because if we don't, then we should all be concerned. And this is precisely part of the reforms that we have put in place to capacitate our law enforcement agencies in some respects, we know that under state capture, their attention had been diverted 
and they had been weakened to a point where a number of really good people in those agencies had left and had been sidelined and had been dealt with. So for me, the important part of the reforms, which many people don't really give government kudos for, is precisely that, to strengthen government and to enable government agencies to act in accordance with the principles that are set out in our constitution. And when they do so, Honorable Kwaka, we will get to the point that you are mentioning now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable President. Honorable members, we'll now proceed to the next question, which is question number five. This has been asked by the Honorable P.J. Grunewald. The Honorable President. Honorable House Chair, this administration places a premium on good governance, due process, and the rule of law. The House made certain determinations in relation to Deputy Minister Dipur Peters. I have sanctioned her in relation to these. In my view, the sanction imposed on her was commensurate with the breaches this House found her to have committed over and above the sanctions imposed by this House. Other current members of the executive implicated by the State Capture Commission have not been charged or found wanting in terms of ethical breaches by anybody at this stage, by any body or entity at this stage. That is important. As I've said before in this House, any actions that I take in respect to members of the executive about whom the Commission made findings will be informed by the outcomes of the processes undertaken by relevant entities. Sorry. I, I have said that... Honorable President, our apologies. Will you disconnect the microphone of the Honorable Liesl van der Merwe, please? And may I remind the Honorable Members who is on the virtual platform that please do not switch on your microphones when you are not recognized to do so. You are disrupting the proceedings. Please proceed, Honorable President. I was saying, as I have said in the past, in this House, any actions that I take with respect to members of the Executive about whom the Commission made findings will be informed by the outcomes of processes undertaken by the relevant entities. And let me say that when you look at the State Capture Commission report, in a number of cases it has said further investigations need to be made in this regard, and so on and so on. And that has helped to inform me that there is a role for a number of other entities to do their work, as I have been saying. It is important to note that Parliament, as being part of those entities, itself has an important role in combating corruption and state capture through its own committees, for instance, through the Ethics Committee and the Powers and Privilege Committee, Privileges Committee. So I want to repeat that I have been saying that various entities which we have empowered and continue to empower to do their work must do their work because in the main they tend to have the capacity and the ability to do their work much more thoroughly and they have that right to do precisely what they are required to do. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Thank you, Honorable President. The first supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Dr. Grunewald. Thank you, Honorable Chair, through you to the Honorable President. Honorable President, this question is not about the Zondo Commission. This is a question about ethics and integrity. Yes. You said that you want facts. Now, let me give you some facts about this specific case of the former Honorable Minister for Transport. Firstly, she did not appoint, she failed to appoint a group CEO. The then board, led by Popo Malefe, found and discovered 14 billion rands of irregular 
expenditure, which I started investigating, and then the Honorable Minister intervened and even dismissed these investigations, where a, the High Court of South Africa then found that she was irrational, unreasonable, and unlawful. So the High Court found that one of your ministers acted unlawful. She even stopped further allegations of corruption. Now, Honorable President, my question and follow-up is to you. What criteria do you set yourself as president for your ministers to comply to when it comes to integrity? Because these actions are undermining your integrity when we speak about corruption. Or is it because of the fact that the other most conduct was that this honorable minister actually allowed the use of Prasa buses in 2014 and 2015 for ANC activities without ensuring payment of that. I thank you. The Honorable President. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Yes, I do place, as I said in my uh, headline reply, if you like, uh, a high premium on good governance, on adherence to the rule of law, and on underlying due process. And I would say due process is an important criteria as one forms a view on the issue of integrity. And in this regard, as I ended my reply, I said, Parliament has an important role to play too in combating corruption. And in this regard, Parliament took action, and Parliament having taken action, it informed me that indeed further action needed to be taken. And that is precisely the action that I took. And it is the action that I decided on. And in the end, one can say right or wrong. But in the end, I'm the one who took the action and based also on a number of factors, including what Parliament decided on. Because in the end, it is the President who decides. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable President. The second supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Jainke. Thank you, House Chair. Mr. President, I, I get a sense that Honorable Grunewald wants you in a bizarre manner to disregard any due process, overlook any nature of allegations. In fact, he wants you to simply adopt a one-size-fits-all template, all in the name of this undefined so-called democratic practice. Can the president, therefore, please reassure this house that the nation and the house and the nation that your commitment against corruption follows due process and is done on a case by case basis that is a swak verkiesings fufi wat u gevra het the honorable president thank you honorable house chair and honorable janki i see that you were able to bring a smile on Mr. Grunewald's face. <laughs> Often good to see him smile a bit. Yes, Honorable Yankee, as I said in my reply, I place a great deal of premium on rule of law, due process, and good governance. And those to me are very important. But the issue of due process is precisely what sometimes we don't pay attention to. And we do need to pay attention to that, that there should be due process, however difficult any matter may be. This House recently dealt, and I've said this in the past, and without being facetious, dealt with the cases of a number of 
uh, highly appointed individuals. And the com the, I must commend the House for following due process, for not acting uh, just on allegations, of having given itself time to go through the processes, some of which are laid out in our Constitution, and coming to a final decision. And that must stand us in good stead as South Africans. And it is a process, Honorable Janki, that actually strengthens our democracy rather than weaken it. It makes our democracy stronger because we are able to demonstrate that, yes, even if there are whatever form of allegations and sayings and whatever, we will follow due process and we will finally get to the real heart of the matter and take action. And this, for me, is important. And may this continue to be what defines the hallmark of our democracy. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Thank you, Honorable President. The third supplementary question will be asked by the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. President. Uh, you wanted kudos, so let me give you some kudos. You certainly talk a good game, but the reality is you're not serious about fighting corruption in your own party. If you were serious, you wouldn't be sitting here with the Deputy President with a slew of allegations over his head. You wouldn't be sitting with a Speaker who has allegations over her head, who's been raided. And if you were serious, your lists would not be filled with people who were accused in the Zondo Commission of State Capture. <laughs> Mr. President, you just mentioned that Parliament is, plays a very important role as a stakeholder in the oversight of this, and that serious matters require accountability. Those were your words. Mr. President, do you accept that a Speaker's House being raided by the National Prosecuting Authority is a serious matter? And do you believe that she should step aside to protect the integrity of this House and its envisaged role in fighting corruption. The Honourable President, order Honourable Members, order. Honourable President, before you proceed, I recognise the Honourable Boroto. Oh, thank you, uh, Honourable House Chair. Honorable House Chair, this is a new question and it has nothing to do with what you are dealing with. This is pure, pure gossip. It's pure gossip and it's a cheap shot. I really want to appreciate that the President doesn't respond. Order, Honorable Members. Order, Honorable Members. Honorable Members. The question posed by the Honorable Grunewald specifically refers to, as an example, a Deputy Minister and members of the executive and the members' interest process. Now, this is a new question. This has no bearing on the primary question. And as order, honorable members, and as we know, a follow-up question must relate directly to the primary question that has been asked. Honorable Sia Nason. House Chair, I'm not wanting to get into a quibble with you, but if, the rule, if you read the rule further, it says, all arises from the response. The President opened the door when he said Parliament has a role to play in, in combating corruption. The President himself, in his response, has opened the door for us to now discuss Parliament's role in this. The Speaker as the representative... Order, Honourable Members. The Speaker as the representative of this House. Thank you. The door was opened by the President himself. Honourable, Honourable Member, now whether the door was opened by the President or not, the fact remains that the due process that the President has referred to has not been followed. And if you want to, you can submit the substantive motion or complain to the Ethics Committee so the Ethics Committee can consider the matter. Right? That, that is uh, where we are, Honourable Members. I don't know, Honourable President, if you want to respond to anything, but really this is a new question. Honourable Chair, House Chair, your ruling is my command. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable Members. Honourable Members, in terms of, in terms of the request for uh, questions to the uh, President, 
there was a fourth opportunity that was available for a supplementary question that has not been taken up by the parties in terms of the rotation uh, that is there. Um, I don't know if there's anyone who wants to make use of an opportunity. <laughs> Order, honorable members. Honorable members, honorable members. Is there any other political party? No, thank you, honorable members. No, I apply the principle of fairness. So if you had an opportunity, I will not allow you again. I will proceed, honorable members, to question number six that has been asked by the honorable check. Yes, honorable member. Point of order, House Chair. House Chair, the NA table advised earlier in the day that these were, uh, were open for parties to apply. They were then allocated. I was notified by the NA table that I would get the slot on, on this fifth follow-up question. This, you can check this with the NA table. The slot should have come to me, uh, House Chair, in terms of the agreed procedure for this. Honorable members, this was not brought to my attention. Right, and I simply, in terms of the, 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 the rules, I will have a discussion with the NA table around the matter, but if you, if you look at the sequence and the fact that, in fact, Honorable Leader of the Opposition, you had an opportunity to ask a question. Um, it is a matter that they should have consulted with, with the presiding officer before making such allocations. And in respect of that, I rule that we proceed to question number six. Sorry, House Chair. Um, I, I order, Honorable Members. Honorable Members, order. Order. Yes, Honorable C. I, I accept your ruling in that mm. regard, but nonetheless, nonetheless, you've put the question, nobody else has wanted to put a question, I raised my hand, and therefore the slot remains vacant and can be filled. There's plenty of precedent of when people don't want to take up an opportunity, that the person wanting to raise their hand is able to do so. Yeah, that is, that is, subject, that is subject to the presiding officer making a determination whether you had a fair opportunity, and I've ruled that that opportunity has been given to you. We now proceed to question number six, asked by the Honorable Teke. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. Honorable members, one of the most important pillars of government's economic recovery plan is a significant increase in infrastructure investment. This has meant that we have had to give specific attention to effective project preparation and the mobilization of funding on a far larger scale. We have amended the Division of Revenue Act to provide for the pledging of future infrastructure grants to crowd in private sector finance and to leverage external technical capacity. This will facilitate integrated planning and implementation. It will also enable the development of a funded maintenance program, a monitoring and evaluation framework, and a governance structure to manage the program delivery. I previously spoke about the Northern Cape and the Eastern Cape as pilot pro provinces to address the social infrastructure backlog in schools, as well as in housing. Infrastructure South Africa is making use of its project preparation facility to support the two pilot provinces to develop quality business cases for submission to Treasury Loans Coordinating Committee and the Budget Facility for Infrastructure. Through this mechanism, we will ensure that social infrastructure, particularly health and education infrastructure, is delivered in a manner that is cost-effective and rapid. It will also help to increase the participation of the private sector, both in terms of financing this build program and also drawing on its expertise and capabilities. As part of capacity building, the Municipal Infrastructure Support Grant, or Agent rather, MISA, is developing guidelines for municipalities to use for project scoping and packaging. Importantly, the Municipal Infrastructure Grant makes provision for a portion 
of the grant to be utilized for refurbishment. Through these efforts, the infrastructure build program is starting to gain momentum. Infrastructure projects worth over 230 billion rand are currently in construction across the country, including in areas such as energy, water, roads, rural bridges, human settlements, as well as student accommodation. These projects are contributing to greater economic activity and creating employment while improving the lives of South Africans and expanding the capacity of our economy. Thank you, Honorable House Chair. The first supplementary question to the President will be asked by the Honorable Tseke. Ere re ra le boga ka rabo ya gago e tlhamaletseng e bile e re netefaletsa gore Afrika borwa ke naga e tlhabologang e tlholang ditiro ke ka mo batho ba tla tswela pele bana le tshepo mo pusong e we yeteletseng pele honorable president government has developed an, an, an approach of intervening directly particularly when municipalities struggle to provide basic services. The Hamanskral cholera incident and the lost lives are also a result of a DA-led municipality that did not cooperate with the National Department of Water and Sanitation to support the municipality in resolving the challenges of wastewater treatment plant in the Ray Valley. We welcome the progress of the national government intervention, Mr. President. In Standard 10, Mr. President, Sandral is also upgrading the roads to high quality standard. Mr. President, building on the foundation laid by the district development model approach, what measures will the national government take to ensure timely intervention and consistent basic service, uh, service provision through quality infrastructure development and maintenance in municipalities with challenges. The Honorable President. Honorable Teke Kialebuha, Potsehu Yahaho. Honorable members, yes, we have over time realized that a number of weaknesses that prevail in various structures of government, particularly local government, have led to the failures of service delivery and have led to, in the case, for instance, of Royval in the Twane Metro, to loss of lives. And that has saddened us. And you raise the issue of the Royval water treatment area where the Department of Water and Sanitation have over many years implored the local government to make the necessary interventions in, set out in legislation, and where they have failed to do so. It came to our attention that we needed to act as national government, and utilizing a provision in the law, we've been able to do precisely that in a way to override the weaknesses of local government and take action directly. Your question is, what will we do to ensure that these things do not happen again? And obviously, through monitoring and evaluation, increasing the capability of our department in that regard will be like the antenna that we need to ensure that we are aware and able to see uh, those weaknesses as to enable us to act with a much greater speed and effectiveness. We are already doing precisely that, and we are finding that it pays great dividends. But we do not do that to the exclusion of the local uh, authority itself. And we seek cooperation and collaboration, particularly through utilizing the district development model, which has become very effective 
in a number of areas where it has been fully embraced. And of course, we now want to move to a point where working together with stakeholders, all of them, uh, will be something that we should rely on more and more. We are looking also at broader involvement of stakeholders in key metros in our country. There are quite a number of metros that are facing serious challenges. And Etewin is one of those, Tswane is one of those, and a number of others. And this is where national government will be making interventions, working together with obviously all our colleagues at that level to make sure that the people of South Africa are well served in the areas where they live. So we have found a very effective method of being able to intervene and we are going to do it more and more to bolster the effectiveness of good governance in all those places. Thank you very much, House Chair. Thank you, Honorable President. The second supplementary question will be asked by the Leader of the Opposition. Again, Mr. President, you talk a good game, and while you talk about infrastructure... Order, Honorable Members, look order. Look what the DA is doing in Cape Town. Its infrastructure budget is larger than, than uh, Etikwini and Johannesburg put together. It's spending 120 billion rand over the next decade on infrastructure. And the bulk of this because you asked, is being spent on upgrading water and sanitation infrastructure in the poorest areas to bring dignity to people. But look at what you're doing in Durban and in Johannesburg with your coalition partners in the economic freedom fighters. No water in the taps, no sewerage pump stations working, people's dignity being eroded every single day. And it's not due to lack of budget, it's due to corruption and cater deployment. What is the question? The President... No, honourable members, just switch off the microphone of that member. Hon honourable members, it's not correct. Just to disrupt another member who's having the opportunity. Please. Honourable Stian Thanks. It's catered deployment that's hollowed out the ability of the state to deliver. Mr. President, will you take personal accountability, because you like to blame Mr. Zuma and others, will you take personal uh, accountability for the damage that you caused and through cater deployment, hollowing out social infrastructure in the country when you were the chairman of the ANC's cater deployment committee at the heart of state capture. Thank you. The Honourable President. Thank you, Honourable. Thank you, Honourable House Chair. And listening to Honourable Stian Hazen. Uh, one would think that we live in a completely different world and country. And indeed, we, we seem to do that. Honorable Chairperson, we're making all efforts. Ayman. Honorable President, our apologies once again. Let's just terminate and switch off the sound feed from that honorable member. Please proceed, Honorable President. Honorable Chairperson, House Chair, we're focusing our attention on how we can improve the lives of South Africans and how we can improve service delivery. And I'm not going to be focusing on politicking or grandstanding. I'll be focusing more on how the lives of South Africans can be improved and how we can make interventions, interventions that are already demonstrating that good work is being done. When we intervened, for instance, in Royval, we found that we can gain a great deal of traction and begin to put things that were being done incorrectly over a number of years by the very uh, DA-led municipality, and so a great deal of traction is being done, and I'm not going to stand here and politic about it, because what matters most is improving the lives of the people of our country in various parts of the country. So I take responsibility 
for making sure that we improve the lives of our people. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable President. The third supplementary question will be asked by the Honorable Sheikh Imam. Thank you, Chairperson. Mr. President, uh, on the issue of infrastructure, will you consider a comprehensive study on the true state of infrastructure countrywide so as to establish which infrastructure needs maintenance and which may need replacing? And added to that, Mr. President, is that we ensure that we have the necessary skills going forward to be able to deal with that. Thank you. The Honorable President. Thank you, Honorable Sheikh Imam. This morning I opened, as I said earlier, the Infrastructure Symposium, which brings together business, investors, financial institutions, as well as government uh, leaders. And this time round, we also have had government leaders from other parts of Africa. And one of the things we talked about was the progress that we are making on infrastructure development in a number of key areas. And one of the things I've said quite often is that we found that with the development that we are engendering, we are beginning and continuing to have a much greater grip and understanding of the infrastructure needs of our country. You come up with a good suggestion that have a study and it will possibly be more consolidate the studies that we now have, the research that we now have, and bring it all into one, if you like, a document or center. We now have a much better grip and understanding on the water uh, framework in our country. Uh, we now have a much better understanding of the roads infrastructure in our country, the human settlements, and the needs that we have, for instance, in health, particularly in the facilities and all that. And bringing that all together obviously will bring to bear our own and enrich our own understanding. This morning we also launched what we call a construction book. The very first time in our country where we brought together the various infrastructure projects that are being implemented, that are close to implementation, that have been properly uh, assessed and all of them have been brought together in one book, which we have made public. And we did so today, this morning, to the investing uh, sector, so that they can have a look at precisely what we're doing. We said that by 2030, we are going to need 4.8 trillion rand investment in infrastructure. And we also said that obviously, in the point that you raise about maintenance, that we are also going to be looking at maintenance because we have tended to tilt more and more towards putting up infrastructure without focusing on maintenance. And you have raised this a few times even in this parliament, and I applaud you and thank you for that because that enables us to focus also on maintenance. So, to answer your question directly, we've got that research uh, that is scattered all over and bringing it together will enable us to look at what are the infrastructure needs and what is underway. The other area has been in project preparation in getting the relevant skills that are required in implementing projects. Uh, this is where your point is a very important one because once we know what the architecture, the landscape rather, of the skills needs and the needs, uh, the skills needs are, or the uh, infrastructure needs and the skills needs are, when we bring them together, we will then be able to have a winning formula. And a winning formula is precisely what we are looking for. But thank you once again for the suggestion that you're making. Thank you. Thank you, Honourable President. Honourable Members, 
As in question five, only three parties have requested a follow-up question. I will now give an opportunity to one of the parties who have not participated in a follow-up question, the Honorable Singh. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. I did give my name to the table when they requested uh, for names. So the last question for the sixth parliament to you, Honorable President. Uh, <laughs> I'm glad the issue of uh, maintenance of buildings has come up. And you did indicate that at the local government level, there are some measures in place to provide for maintenance. But the challenge is not only at local government level. At national and provincial level, we have major challenges. I mean, we read the other day on a quote from the Minister of Police, we paid more money trying to fix that thing than we paid for buying it. And he's sitting at home for four years not using an official building. We have buildings like this in Durban that are managed by the province. Now, while it's important to maintain, Mr. President, will you consider advising the Minister of Finance that we should top slice sections of the budget of each department to provide specifically, specifically for maintenance of assets? Because many of these buildings go into a state of disrepair and we cannot use them afterwards. The same happens with water infrastructure, electricity infrastructure, and things like that. Thank you, Mr. President. Honorable President. As the last answer, I should say I agree. <laughs> I couldn't agree more. Um, and as I said earlier in answering Honorable Sheikh Imam, that one of the weaknesses that has prevailed in government is that we focus more on putting up the facilities, the buildings, without setting aside a budget on a continuous basis to maintain those facilities. Because if you look at every facility on, from an accounting point of view, there's depreciation from the very day that you finish. It begins to depreciate and you need to start addressing the physical degradation of any facility that you build and you need to have the budget to be able to do so. So that is something that we need to inculcate in the culture of budgeting as well, in the culture of, of looking after the assets of our nation. Uh, it's something that needs to be growing more and more amongst us as a culture. And I welcome your suggestion and thank you very much for all the suggestions. Honorable members, that concludes questions to the president. I want to thank the honorable president for his presence in the chamber this afternoon and for the replies. Thank you. Order, honorable members. Order. All the honourable members, I now request you to stand and wait for the chairperson and the mace to leave the chamber. That concludes the business for the day and the house is adjourned. Kenny, Kenny, Mutaung.